Okay, and with that, um, tonight uh, is the beginning of a series on the sharing economy uh, by Hank. It will be about three, um, uh, three meetings, maybe four, it depends upon what new sharing uh, example comes up. Maybe we'll pop it in as it goes on. Um, and so, um, as many of you know, we've been uh, experiencing some of that here in our neighborhood. Some people consider it to be ground zero for the sharing economy as the litmus for how the rest of the city will, will be dealing with it on expansion. Um, so, Kristen Evans, who is uh, the president of the Haight-Ashbury Merchants Association, she also owns Booksmith on Haight Street. Uh, she's our uh, our merchant uh, liaison representative to Hank, and she uh, worked very, very hard on uh, making a presentation. Uh, we both uh, contributed uh, a lot of the information to it, but she's going to do the presentation tonight, and I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> so um, when Hank started a uh, uh, conversations about doing this series, um, I raised my hand to make this introduction, the first in the series uh, presentation. And of course, like a lot of things I volunteer for, a few days later I was like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> um, but actually, I feel really um, great about the experience of learning more about a subject that I felt like I had a little bit of a loose handle on, but now feel like I have a, a much stronger handle on. Um, and I hope you will feel the same way too after this talk. So um, in my presentation today, I'm going to give a brief introduction about uh, what is the sharing economy. And we're putting it in quotes because sharing is a, a, a word that has meaning. And is that really a good meaning for what we're talking about? Um, we also have a 10 minute video that I'm going to show that is uh, a, a trailer for a forthcoming documentary on the sh what it's called Share Economy. And it's a good way to kind of get a little bit additional context for what the conversation is tonight. Then uh, I'm going to just narrow it down and get really specific about what was particularly true for her when she was looking at it, is that in the, in the course of an economic downturn, the people were looking at ways to, uh, you know, spur job growth, uh, find new sources of income, and, and essentially, in many cases, monetize assets that they already possessed. So whether that's monetizing their home by renting it out via Airbnb, or monetizing their car by leasing it through Getaround, essentially it was allowing people to find new sources of income. So these three kind of things in her structure come together to really uh, lead the, the share, share, sharing economy forward. Um, just before we go back. Um, so she likes the two examples that she uses a lot is Netflix and Zipcar. Um, and Netflix, again, like photos, digital photo sharing, is not, a, it's, it's sharing information. So she, she talks about up until now, the information revolution has primarily slept through industries and services that are or can be digital. Numbers, text, sound, images, and videos. And now mobile networks are rapidly expanding that disruption to physical goods and services. So that's why that's happening now. Okay, so here's a, you know, like a, a, just a high level of how much this is disrupting just about every aspect of our economy, right? Resale of secondhand goods. So the uh, new ventures are eBay, Craigslist, Amazon, especially the Amazon that allows third party uh, trading. Um, what were the ways that we got rid of secondhand goods before? It was auction houses, classifieds, estate sales, liquidators, uh, secondhand stores, right? So there, basically there's, there was a way that we took care of resale of secondhand goods, and now the internet creates a new marketplace where we can sell those goods. Uh, similarly, we used to go to the video store and rent a video from Blockbuster, now we can use Netflix. Uh, we used to go to the record store, I still do, but some people don't, uh, <laughs> um, and listen to the radio. Now people can download their music with uh, BitTorrent, uh, Napster, iTunes, uh, or listen to a radio version of digital music, Pandora, Spotify, and many others. Transportation. 
how did I get from point A to B? I used to get to point A to B using taxi, a town car, traditional car ownership, car rental, and public transportation. Now I have a plethora of new options. I can take a Lyft, I can Uber, I can take a zip car, a city car share, a scoop, a relay ride, a get around. Or if I'm on a regular commute, I might <coughs> take one of the disruptive um, uh, public transportation uh, startups, Chariot, or the uh, uh, corporate shuttle. Um, and then in terms of short-term rentals, I used to go and stay at a hotel or a bed and breakfast. Now I have the option to also do a short-term rental in the form of an Airbnb. So that's just, what, six groupings of industries. For every one that I just mentioned, there's multiply it times 10, right? There are that, there's that much disruption <coughs> happening right now. And that just kind of, as I started to think about that, that blew my mind. Can you read that? Um, yeah. We used to live in a world where there were people who were private citizens and a world where there were businesses. And now we're living in a world where people can become businesses in 60 seconds. And this was a quote by Brian Chesky, CEO of Airbnb. So um, we're now going to um, take 10 minutes to watch a short video, um, uh, and uh, then we'll continue. We're used to an economy in which everybody does one thing with one company for eight to ten hours a day, five days a week. We're coming to a really important time where resources are limited, population are rising rapidly, and if we don't do something about it, you know, our communities are going to break down. So we're facing a triple crisis of environment, economy, and social division. We can't continue with the economy that we have now. That is a bus riding off the edge of a cliff. As it turns out Americans made more than three and a half billion dollars last year using some of the things in their everyday lives. People are making money on all the things around their home, going unused so much of the time. It's called the sharing economy. And tonight we're showing you the real money that you can make just by renting out what you already have. When we look at the main drivers behind this kind of activity, the first, technology. New, innovative technologies that allow us to connect with more people and find more things to share. Secondly, a, a shift more broadly towards values that embrace openness, humanness, connectedness. Third, economic realities, which the 2008 global crisis brought home. And finally, environmental pressures, so population growth, limited natural resources, um, and a growing awareness of the effects of climate change. Sharing you know, does two things. It radically reduces resource consumption and it can increase access uh, to resources at the same time, right? So this is why it's share or die for us. We're in a kind of share or die moment. I'm Peg and I'm an Airbnb host and I have been an Airbnb host for almost three years. I was laid off April 30th of 2009. Another regular job isn't necessarily a, a good objective. So the idea of sharing um, definitely uh, help a lot. It helps pay the mortgage. I don't think of them as strangers. I think of them as friends I haven't met yet. Nice meeting you. <laughs> okay. It takes commitment and, you know, if I commit to a guest coming, I can't say, oh, it's not going to work today, you know. I'm committed. And it's lots of connecting, that's for sure. So I am not a professional chef. I don't claim to be at all. Mm -hmm. I don't charge what a professional chef charges. I just charge enough to cover the cost of ingredients. I was taught well. My mom is an amazing cook. Growing up around her and just kind of, you know, following her trail around the kitchen gave me the confidence that you need. I'm just someone who really loves to cook and to share something I've created. You never know who you're going to meet who's going to come through your door. It's, it's fun. I enjoy it. And until I stop enjoying it, I'm going to keep doing it. People are sharing with strangers now. They're sharing their home. They're sharing their car. They're giving strangers rides. They're having strangers over for dinner. 
people are sharing money, you can actually start to ask people to invest in what you're doing. I just remember being like, yeah, we're gonna do a Kickstarter, and yeah, everybody's gonna love it, and we're gonna raise the money, and it, it kind of worked out that way. <laughs> Thanks for watching our video. We're Alchemy Collective, and I'm Payam. This is James, Chris, and Rob. We will be the first worker-owned specialty cafe in California, and maybe anywhere. Just having that feeling that your ideas are important is really powerful, because you can watch people and how they interact with customers, and how the customers interact with them. There's so much more mutual respect. So we can't take the same corporate forms we've always used and just plug the sharing economy into those. We need to create new types of corporations or uh, adapt old types of corporations. Corporatize everything. <laughs> it's about a revolution in the way that people share goods and services and the way they connect with people in their cities. I think we're really craving that. I think our generation is craving to be connected to other people. The sharing economy is a true uh, movement and I think it's a big economic and social trend. Seen those crazy cars that are out and about with the fuzzy pink mustaches driving around town? It's a new rideshare company and it's called Lyft. You guys are in the world famous hip hop Lyft tonight. I host a hip-hop trivia game in my car with my passengers, and my passengers actually compete for prizes from me. I'm a father full-time, and basically, I'm just trying to get my stuff popping. Who knows what's going to come out of this, man? I'm hoping that great things come, man. Now it's time to take a walk. My first single in, like, years. This is exciting right here. See, my song is called Fist Bump. You know what I'm it's all about lift and hip hop lift. Diddy in my city, it's all right. I got my lift app and my smartphone with me. Open it up, request a ride. Driving two minutes away, and I ain't gotta stand on the street. L Y F T, Fist Bump, if you wanna ride with me. Swipe, I bet you wanna ride with me now. Swipe, I bet you wanna ride with me now. L Y F T, Fist Bump, if you wanna ride with me. This isn't actually a sharing economy. You're not sharing anything. You're exchanging money for a ride. We wouldn't mind the competition if we were all playing by the same rules, but they're taking our business that we rely on and they're just going out and skimming off the cream and taking what we need to survive. A, a new type of service that doesn't have to follow our rules, that's driving around, in fact, without proper and adequate insurance, that's leaving the public uh, unprotected and at risk because they don't have adequate and proper insurance. Right now, we're in the midst of an intense uh, housing uh, set of challenges. We don't have enough affordable housing for everyone who wants to live here. And the idea that you could simply take off the marketplace rental units or homes that could otherwise be used to permanently house San Francisco families doesn't sit well with many of us. And so we're crafting legislation to really address that situation. It's just a different, fills a different need for people. It's about community more than the food, I think. And if the restaurant industry is really threatened by that, then they're gonna need to get more creative and find ways to incorporate that community aspect into their business, you know? Any new area that the shareable economy has entered is disrupting what has been an old way of doing things. Sort of 21st century disruptive technologies that are challenging 20th centuries of how, uh, how people interact with each other. Law is what we make it. It is this continuous conversation within society and people who push the law, who change technologies, are changing law by changing what society values, prioritizes, and thinks about. By 2020, it's estimated that 40% of the entire workforce population of the United States will be technically freelance. It's this, it's this great risk shift, right, where businesses have reordered themselves so that they do not have to bear any risk. When we look at subcontractors, temp workers, independent contractors across the board, how are we going to protect these people who we call non-workers? It's very fluid, which I think is not um, something that people really experience before as an option for income. They can make it financially possible for themselves um, to be free from the requirements of a rigid job. We're kind of at a moment similar to like 
what happened in the Industrial Revolution when factories started to become uh, big employer, like there wasn't work protections and the institutions uh, to support them haven't really emerged yet, but are emerging. That shift doesn't mean that these companies are only about creating community. At the end of the day, you can't run a business unless you are making money. It's important that people really believe what they're saying when they say sharing economy, not this is a nice buzzword for me to get a huge valuation and shovel a bunch of money in my pocket. Sustainability and altruism runs around fifth on the list of things on why they're in this space. In the end, people want to use this because it's fast and cheap. You know, the 90s was about getting people online. And, and the 2000s was about connecting people online with things like Facebook um, and social networks. And I think the next decade of, of companies will be about connecting people offline. As connected as we are today, a lot of people still feel disconnected. It's like that person with 5,000 friends on Facebook but still eating alone. And we want to leverage the power of the internet and technology to be able to bridge that online offline divide. This isn't just technology driven change or increases in efficiency. I mean it's a confluence of a bunch of different factors. We've got the technology, we've got the economic drivers, we've got the sociological drivers. And so to me this is here to stay and this is going to be huge. I don't think we are even close to living up to our full potential. I think we are seeing the smallest sliver of the iceberg of what we could do. And that's what makes me so excited. We are so early into this, and we're doing a decent job with like what we know today. We ha you have not seen anything yet. The economy isn't something out there abstract. It's our creation, and if we created it, we can recreate it. I don't know if I would say the sharing economy can save the world, but I can say that we can save the world, and I think the sharing will be an enormous part of it. In the end, it's not going to be a peer economy or a sharing economy or a collaborative economy. It's just going to be called an economy. enter it into film festival competition for next year. So uh, you may have to wait until uh, this time next year to see it. But, um, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. I uh, had a chance to talk to him on the phone. He's in Seattle, otherwise he said he would love to have joined us tonight. Um, but he uh, said if there's any call to action that, um, sorry, that was just a, There we go. No, he said, if there was one call to action that he thought his documentary film might have um, on their website and as they uh, uh, launch this out next year, is that uh, we should do exactly what we're doing, which is that we should be gathering together as citizens, educating ourselves about the changes these businesses are creating, and have discussions about them. And he said, we should be engaging at this point in the public dialogue and legislative process. And we will need to be contacting our elected officials about what policy changes need to be made. So that completely reaffirmed why we were having this meeting in the first place. Great. Thank you. So um, now I'm going to take it down to specifically Kate Ashburn. Zipcar and City Car Share actually been around for a long time. I don't know, has anyone used uh, Zipcar? Show of hands. Couple people years ago. Okay, city car share. Yeah. No. Got okay, right. great. So more, more, more. That doesn't surprise me. This room is using city car share. <laughs> um, um, so Zipcar actually started in 2000 and was based on an existing German and Swiss company model that was being used there. Um, in 2005, they secured uh, 10 million dollars, only 10 million dollars, from Benchmark Capital. Uh, and they opened in San Francisco. 
And in the next eight years, uh, they exploded, of course, globally. Um, and in 2013, uh, they were sold to Avis uh, Budget Group for $500 million cash. Um, City Car Share uh, was the only car sharing company in San Francisco uh, from 2001 to 2005. Uh, it was founded as a nonprofit and is currently the largest nonprofit car sharing program in the United States. But as I understand, they're all local, local. It's all Bay Area specific uh, car rental. Um, these two companies are part of an early pilot uh, that the city of San Francisco is going through right now to put 900 dedicated spots for car sharing in the public realm. And this is a map of our neighborhood. So this is Stanion, and this is Masonic. And you can see each one of these dots uh, represents a requested parking spot or two. Um, and uh, they uh, started the conversations last summer, and they've just started to put some of the signs up. But the goal in this first phase of the pilot is to have 900 of these citywide, and with the potential of it expanding greater than that. So get around uh, that uh, Aston Kutcher, if anyone knows that actor, is an investor in. Um, they're a for-profit company. You may not have heard of them, but they are growing really quickly right now. Um, they uh, allow you to rent your car to other people. So let's say Calvin doesn't need his car on Saturdays because he's got a standing hot date. And, <laughs> and so he right. <laughs> and so he wants to put his vehicle up for use on Saturday. Saturday weekends are a really popular time for people to, to rent cars. Um, and so uh, he could put it up on, on the website and people could come uh, get his car and, and take it for, for the day or for a couple hours. Um, they now are allowing some of their regular members to apply for these designated street parking spots. So if you do that, you would have a week-long parking spot for your car. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about this because what's different about this and with regards to the other sharing programs is that this is disrupting the public comments. This is actually uh, in taking spaces, public spaces, tax that you as taxpayers pay for, and is privatizing that space. So this particular spot is at the corner of Schrader and Haight Street. It was a metered parking space. And this uh, pilot program basically leases out that parking space for probably less money than what that meter would make. And it's less money than what any of us could, could, would pay for a private parking space off the street. So it's really a subsidy for these uh, companies to try out their new startup. And uh, what you may not know is that during this pilot program, they're exempted from the 72-hour parking rule. They're also exempted from having to move their car during street cleaning. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, and um, and so you know they they use a lot of privilege that comes with it. But at the same time, while this one here is on Trader Street, there are two more right in front of Whole Foods. So that now within one square block, you've got three public parking spaces that have been removed, and there has been no public dialogue, conversation, introduction, mm -hmm. contact, engagement about where these spaces should be located, okay? And so it's really uh, an interesting thing because um, with merchants, they need to have ample parking for their customers. Mm -hmm. For residents, and, and workers at the same time, for residents that don't have garages, you gotta park on the street. So for every parking space that was metered that gets taken off the public commons, and it gets privatized in this way, those people who would normally uh, pay for a metered spot will now park in a, probably a residential parking space because there's less of an inventory. So hold your questions because we've got a couple more slides I want to get through before we get to that point. So um, this map, uh, on each of these, I put a map of our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Scoop, have you heard of Scoop? 
have you seen the red scooters out and about? Yeah. They don't even pay the city a dime. They are just taking street spots. This is how many scoots are available in our area right now. So um, also wanted to mention that there are uh, these cars that are roaming around the neighborhood, right? And they're not necessarily taking a parking spot. Sometimes they are if they're waiting for a fare. Um, UberX and Lyft. And UberX, you want to talk a little bit about the history of UberX? Okay, so uh, let's uh, just talk about the history of Uber in general. So uh, way back when, before the economic downturn, you had taxi cabs, and then you had limousines and town cars, livery basically, what you see the TCP numbers on the back of bumpers. And so those companies are private companies, sometimes they're fleets of lim limousines, sometimes they're just an independent contractor, a, a person with one car. But they were prohibited under city law to, to pull over and pick up a fare along the curb. So when you go to get a cab, you hail a cab, those limousine companies and town car companies were uh, prohibited from doing that. But during the economic downturn, who was calling for a limo? Nobody could really afford it. So their uh, income started to plummet, and they were looking to find ways for them to pick up uh, fares in some other kind of way. Intro to Uber. Uber comes along. People can contact these people in some kind of newfangled way to be able to drive up to wherever they were standing on the curb, pick them up, and take them away. And this was somehow circumventing city law. Uh, that then expanded into UberX, which enabled anyone with a car to do the same thing. And so this is now a disruption, not usually when we think of disrupt, it, it, the concept of disrupting companies is not new. I mean, this is what happens in big corporations all over the world all the time. Somebody comes up with a new innovation and pushes the old fangled way out of the way. You know, it's... There's a new, brand new invention for a product that has already been, or a service that's been. The existing. Buffalo works this way. That's right. <laughs> and so, um, but we usually see that within the private corporate economies. What we don't see is disruption of public services. And that is what the crux of what we're uh, talking about here today is that a lot of these services like Uber, which is probably the most famous and most prevalent, there are plenty of others, are now disrupting, for all, sake and, uh, for all intents and purposes, the taxi cab industry. Uh, the other ones we're talking about is like uh, Chariot um, and the tech buses that you've seen, things like that are disrupting larger public transit. For us, it's Muni. And so this is where it becomes really concerning. Uh, because it's one thing if they want to play in their own sandbox and disrupt each other, but it's another thing when you start affecting the taxpayers and their services. Um, so Karma is a carpooling app. So um, this map basically shows you uh, San Francisco to uh, Menlo Park. And I go down to Menlo Park maybe once or twice a week. And I would have the option to basically carpool with somebody, right? So that, this is an app that essentially facilitates that. So looking at that app, I can see that there were three options to carpool with somebody. So that's what uh, Karma is about. So we've seen this proliferation of transportation options. And I thought this was a really interesting uh, two, uh, two by two that uh, I found on the internet. But basically, uh, you can think about, do I want to be driven? Or do I want to drive myself? Do I want to use somebody else's car? Or do I want to use my own car? And so you can see that there's a whole proliferation of plays that happen in just the transportation sphere. So think about that, how that plays out in other uh, industries. But um, on this side, this is what we call peer-to-peer uh, -peer car rental. So I rent, your, I rent Calvin's car. Uh, car sharing, where I'm renting a zip car. Over here, it's a peer-to-peer -peer taxi, so I'm uh, using somebody else's car as a taxi. Or Flywheel, which is an app which allows me to hail a traditional taxi, or Uber a traditional town car. And uh, Chariot and the other 
shuttles that allow me to bypass Muni, but essentially follow the Muni route. So there's a whole range of transportation options that have come up through the sharing economy. Monkey parking. Uh, there were two uh, new businesses that came up in the course of me putting this presentation together. <laughs> and this was one of them. So you had probably heard about monkey parking that was trying to give people the option to sell their public parking space. So, oh, I need to park downtown. Um, I'm going to go look and see, oh, Bruce has got a spot over in front of the McDonald's on Market Street. I want that spot. So I pay him for his public parking spot. He comes out, he moves his car, and I take his parking spot. City didn't like that. Can't do that. They killed that business model. They're back. <laughs> and their new business model is rent the space in front of your driveway. So I have a driveway. I share with a neighbor. I could go in on a deal with him that on Saturdays we won't leave the house. We'll rent the spot in front of uh, our <coughs> house for $10 uh, flat rate, and people can shop on Haight Street. Okay. Other uses of the public commons in uh, Haight-Ashbury. Parkwide, you guys are probably familiar with the bike rental company that is a uh, concession through Park and Rec. We don't have these here in our neighborhood yet, but they are here in San Francisco and around the Bay. The Bay Area Bike Share, so it's a a private company that the city, or that the Bay Area has uh, deemed um, uh, the, the concessionaire for using the public space to do a bike rental service. You guys probably have sampled the goods at Off the Grid. So these are the trucks that come into the public realm and have essentially an open air restaurant for Thursday nights. Airbnb, it's been in the news a lot. VRBO, also a short-term rental, huge disruptor. How to knows the most about this? The uh, eviction map, right? So this is creating a business model to monetize your apartment and your home, and instead of uh, having people living in your building permanently, it becomes like a hotel, and that's created an economic model that has really spurred evictions. Uh, Task Rabbit and Home Joy. Um, I need to go pick. I had this happen to me. Somebody, somebody uh, called the bookstore and they said they needed 20 copies of a book. Could I order it for them? I said, yes, I could. They said, I'm going to send a Task Rabbit for it. That's right. So I said, you're going to send a what? <laughs> I'm going to send a Task Rabbit. So this is hiring somebody to go run your errand for you or clean your house, or uh, repair your car, or fix your, your leaky sink. So this is the monetization of all types of services. Okay, so that is just a very high level of what we're talking about. Now let's just get a high level of the criticism and critique of this disruption. So, the, the biggest takeaway, and I think the documentary did a good job of it as well, is to take away that sharing mystique, right? It's not about, I'm really going to loan Bruce my hammer and not expect anything in return and we're sharing a hammer. It's about, it's an economic business model, okay? So, some of these business models are actually fairly predatory. And um, so, it's not altruism. We are, uh, uh, these are essentially middlemen seeking to maximize profit. No, city car share, you can make a case. Some of the nonprofits, they've got different motives, but um, by far the majority, the vast majority, are looking to make a, a payday. Anyone know about Peter Thiel? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> I mentioned I hadn't heard of this book, but this one I had, and the reason I had is because it's been the top-selling business book at both Booksmith and Kepler's this last year. So Peter Thiel wrote a book, Zero to One, and I'm going to paraphrase his, his, his big point. Uh, well, actually, I don't have to. He did. 
in an article that he wrote for the Wall Street Journal. He said, competition is for losers. If you want to create and capture lasting value, look to build a monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you get the sense of, <laughs> you get the sense of what the motive is, right? Um, a lot of these ventures are being fueled by venture capital. So they're very speculative. They're also buying the market, right? So I can buy that $8 burrito that's delivered to me from the, the Spoon Rocket car, and that's as the same price that I can buy it from uh, the taqueria next door, but theirs is fancier and has lots of cool things with it. And so their cost model is different, right? So is it that they really um, have an economic model that's a winner, or is it that they're basically trying to buy a customer base? Now, what, why would they want to buy a customer base? We'll get to the Q&A. Um, the other uh, thing that um, you just alluded to, Bruce, is that these startups often will flaunt local laws. Uh, they often seek to avoid tax. They are involved also in the corruption of our political process. You know how much uh, money is being thrown at our officials. You mentioned they're exploitative. The other concerning thing is that they, they really, these, these companies really lack diversity. They are primarily white males, and so they have a very one, one tiered view of what society's needs are and how society should run. Um, and they, uh, quite frankly, as you pointed out, are exacerbating uh, income inequality. Um, let me go to the next one. They're doing that by, uh, by the large part, uh, encouraging people to give up traditional employment and become an independent contractor. And I've experienced this firsthand with one of my staff members who was doing some sharing economy and didn't realize the tax consequences of what was going to happen if she was participating in that. So she's figured that out this month. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, uh, people that are becoming Lyft drivers or renting out their homes, preparing a meal for other people, are unwittingly signing themselves up for additional risk and costs. Um, they don't necessarily understand the tax consequences. And quite frankly, in some cases, they're being really misled about what the payday will be for them. So um, uh, I thought this was great reporting in San Francisco Magazine, um, where they had uh, uh, the smartest bro in the room profile of the CEO of Uber. And uh, she uh, found that although Uber repeatedly claims that its drivers can make a median of $74,000 a year in San Francisco, numerous reports indicate this figure is rosy at best, willfully misleading at worst. And some cursory arithmetic based on numbers from Uber's blog reveals that to make that much, drivers would need to complete 3.4 full rides an hour or work a lot more than 40 hours a week. Uh, further, the $74,000 a year figure is gross pay and does not account for the cost of gas, car maintenance, and the like. So essentially, um, people are opting out of traditional employment, which has minimum wage protection, anti-discrimination protection, um, organizing rights, um, and assuming new risks, costs, and tax liabilities that they may not even be aware of. Um, all these folks are now out of the em employee market, so to speak. So as we recently experienced with the economic downturn, it was in the news, headlines, every day, what's the employment, unemployment rate, okay, and how is it going to be dropping? But then there were these extensions for unemployment because people couldn't get jobs. What happens when all these people become independent contractors? Can they go for unemployment? Not going to happen. So this is an interesting <laughs> dynamic that is happening. And you can just imagine what it's like to have all these people that have left their jobs, went into business for themselves, and then what happens when Uber goes bust? What happens? Now, you may not know, Uber's been kind of banned from 
about half a dozen countries, yeah. like whole countries, yeah. hmm. and a number of cities here in this country. Um, and it's, there's actually a big discussion in, in Sacramento about what to do about all this right now. So what happens when when that happens? Okay, and all these people, they're going to be, you're going to see unemployment rise again. So when we, when everybody talks about unemployment and how it's getting lower and lower, this is just a snapshot for today. It's not any predictor of what's going to happen in the future. The next slide uh, talks about Robert Reich. So also uh, a, a, a book book person who writes books, who reads books, met him, very nice guy, um, really getting specific about um, the economic disruption. He's mostly known probably for his um, defense of unions and the labor movement, um, but he is basically um, becoming a real spokesperson for the critique of um, these businesses. And so to, to conclude, I wanted to leave us with a thought, which is what is not to like about the sharing economy, and it's the shared disruption, right? Because the disruption isn't just for, for one person, it's for all of us. Q&A. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it very much what I'm hearing tonight. Your argument that this is uh, interference with public commons is the central argument, mm -hmm. I think, that's going on here. And I'm just curious, what was the compelling argument that was offered in the case of the parking spaces to the government mm -hmm. that made them decide this was a good idea? Mm -hmm. So I can speak to that because um, that originally they were planning to put them on King Street. Uh, the, they were going to take out uh, spots in front of businesses for get around. And um, uh, we basically opposed them putting it anywhere on Hate Street. And uh, the argument that they present is uh, based on a UC Berkeley study of city car share about how each car sharing vehicle takes seven other vehicles off the street. And so the idea is, is that whether it's a nonprofit like City Car Share or a for-profit like Get Around or Zipcar, then uh, we're gonna take seven cars off the street for every one that uh, is shareable. Now, but, yeah. But that, that implies yes. that there are no other parking locations other than the street. Uh, for car sharing, and within Hate Street, there are several dozen car share locations mm -hmm. at parking garages, at uh, 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 city-owned parking garages and at private parking garages. In fact, there's a gigantic parking lot that has both zip cars and city car shares right next to Keysar. Mm -hmm. Correct. So their argument was that the closer they get the cars right. to people, the more likely that they'll use them. So I might not use the car in the Kizar lot as frequently if it's six blocks away from my house, but if it's two blocks or one block or right in front of my house, I'm gonna use that car a lot more. Which contradicts the notion that you reduce car rides. Correct. And, car <laughs> yeah, that's not right. and, it, and so obviously the argument is being made off of a study that was based on, so on the city. On that, to go, right? go ahead. Then, you want to finish up? So, okay. so, just so we we're probably going to have a session that goes into specifically the car sharing a little bit more detail. But uh, in preparation for that, I've been talking to various people this week, and, uh, including people from the Transportation uh, Sustainability Research Center at Berkeley. There are about eleven studies now that, that look at um, car sharing and whether. It, the impact on vehicle ownership, on the, the number of miles that are traveled by people who, uh, who have car sharing available as, as opposed to what they did before and as opposed to other people. They, they vary quite a lot. Several of them have been done in, in San Francisco specifically on city car share. Uh, all of them have uh, shown quite a significant reduction in, in, uh, in car ownership. So the number of 
of cars that are owned by people in the program compared to what they had before or what they, what they, what they say they would have bought, which is a little more difficult to quantify. So that's, if, that's the argument at the, the point of, you know, why is car sharing as a, a, a potentially a good thing for, for cities? It doesn't really say whether it should be on the street or off street. The argument that San Francisco accepted, that our supervisors accepted in putting this pilot program together was that this is such a good thing that we should be giving up parking spots to do it because it'll have a net benefit to parking because we'll be getting rid of you know, private cars. But quite how that dynamic plays out, I think was taking a lot on, on, on trust in that. And the process of how those spots are selected, where's appropriate, where's not, is not quite what you might expect it is. You know, it's really pretty much like, what would you like? Let's, let's give you that. Um, just one other thing to mention. When I did speak to the research, uh, research center uh, this week, one of the things that, that I, had, I, I thought was very interesting was that, as far as they know, San Francisco is the only city that allows on-street car sharing for uh, what are called um, round-trip car sharing, city car share, zip car, and so on. So there are quite a few other cities that allow it for you pick a car up from a place on the street, you drive it up to the side of the city, and you drop it off somewhere. But San Francisco is the only one that's dedicated spaces to these com these companies to Re return to base. Yeah, return to base. Anyway, we're we're planning to maybe have. Well, you know, I mean, there's no end. I mean, I, I've got I've got a body. You know, I think I've heard that people actually sell that too. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm an innocent in these things, but I am wondering. And, and, and this, you know, it's really, it's really ironic to be here in Haight Ashbury, which is the locus of, you know, a lot of genuine spirit of, you know, communal sharing, mm -hmm. and you have the image of that, the '60s being so disparaged by the right wing, um, for radical notions of all sorts, but they're using the imagery of it. Mm -hmm with all this idea of connection and uh, friendship and love and uh, mm. you know we're a we're a co-op now and so if you throw a co-op in the, in the in the name you know your goal so that's just really ironic but what I'm my real question is this and that is in brick and mortar economy we said look you got you guys who are doing chain stores you know you're not really authentically in the local economy. You're replicating something that looks local, but you're actually coming in and withdrawing goods, withdrawing resources. So we have formula retail uh, limits. They're not perfect, but there's something to address that. And the, the, the upside, of course, is more diversity and, and, and more local uh, exchange. Look, and more character, where you could say that what we need is the analogous thing. Well, they but if it doesn't apply, if, it, if we can't imagine it, then we've got to shut it down altogether. You know? Well, brick and mortar, you can use Amazon as a good example. I mean, they sell goods, they have all wear warehouses. But what they've done is they've optimized the delivery model. Uh, but it's put a lot of the traditional brick and mortar storefront type of businesses out of business. Well that's why I boycott them, right? I mean, so. Well, right. But that but that's exactly that there's your there's your model. Yeah. And, and I do think we'll hear a lot more about that in particular as the minimum wage continues to rise here in San Francisco. Because what we'll see is that there'll be more and more businesses that really can't compete by raising prices, um, like bookstores, like record stores, and We've already started to see that. I don't want anyone to think that Booksmith is going to close because we're not going to close. Um, we already pay well above the min well above. I wish I could pay my staff well above the minimum wage. We pay above the minimum wage. And you and I have spoken about that. Yeah. In, in, in other words, bookstores have, ma have managed to figure out a way to dance with the devil and to use certain aspects of Amazon's right. existence in order to survive. Right. So, so, so Booksmith, as a, the case example, we have diversified the revenue. Right, away from just selling new books. Although we also still are selling more books than we ever have. 
But we do that by doing a lot of events. So we bring people in of the 200 plus events that we're doing, about 5% of them are ticketed. So we're selling books through those events as well as selling ticket revenue for 5% of our events. And then we've also added other items, right? We have tote bags at the register. Those are a great seller for us. So you know, there are other things that we're, that uh, quite frankly, a tourist isn't gonna pick up a book um, uh, all the time. And so they're more likely to pick up a t-shirt or a tote. Let, let me ask you a question yeah. with regards to books. It's a good example of disruption, mm -hmm. e-books. How have e-books affected online books, electronic books that you can download from the internet and read on a tablet or your, even your cell phone, your smartphone? How's that affect, affected sales? Sales because that was a big concern in most bookstores. Yeah, and at one time. and um, you know, Meba's really um, laid off workers and continues to cut back. Um, and recipes I understand is not doing so hot right now either. But I think one thing that record stores, right, record stores. But one thing I think bookstores have done differently, and it's also different about our product, is that bookstores were always in the business of being community bookstores. The bookstores that are really doing well and thriving right now are ones that have really tight connection with community. So authors come and have talks, and we know them, and we know their kids' names, and we enjoy their company, and they bring their 80 friends, and we sell their books. And so there's this community that has insulated us from the full impact of uh, people migrating their purchasing online. Um, the other component of that is that there is a physicality to books that um, people... They're kind of like entryways into becoming, you know, full-fledged programs. And the city is kind of on a trend right now where act as if, ask questions later, you know, answer questions later, and, you know, and usually they won't answer. So the thing just gets implemented despite the public's outcry on it, so... There's an old saying, um, Apologize instead of asking. In a sense, at this point, it's like the, the people that are participating as workers in this economy without minimum wage protections and all that. Is it sort of a group that was probably exploited in other decades too, like our kids' generation just out of college, immigrants, you know, people who haven't had a lot of other choices in the economy? And is there, is there some way to get a handle on this by you know reaching out to that group and, and educating them? Like, you know, get these, Teach for America people who right. get shot out of the cannon in college, they get burned out working in charter schools in two or three years and they quit, and then there's just another group to take their place. Well, that's true, so I and mean, there is very no, similar in other generations. But, they, but those folks then have to see that this isn't working first. Right. Okay, and what isn't, what we have seen is, uh, at least starting with Uber, Uber is now the poster child for all these explo exploitative uh, uh, instances is that there are lawsuits now to declare Uber drivers as employees. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, and it's one of the slides showed that in order to actually make a living, uh, that they would have to actually work 40 hours a week. Now if you're an independent contractor, you work more than 20 hours a week for one client, you're an employee. That's the general rule of thumb. And if you were to walk into uh, the unemployment office, which is uh, e e EDD office, right. they will side with you, yeah, very fast, and uh, uh, and so that is kind of what's going on with that. Once things like that happens more and more, once that get, get, gets solidified, then you'll have the opportunity to say, okay, now these people got to find something else to do, Calvin. Yeah, at, at, at the risk of sounding terribly self-serving, I want to thank you both. Uh, I think this is a, a very fine introduction to what we hope is a, is a multi-month uh, uh, program because of the importance that uh, the Hank Ward feels uh, around this issue. I want to deal with, uh, I think, a, a very important point that you made. I'd like to emphasize it. And that is uh, certainly an Uber and certainly an Airbnb, but I believe also uh, <clears throat> the implications, for example, of the chef who goes to people's homes, uh, uh, puts together a meal, and sells it is a restaurant. Uh, we have a long established uh, health department regime of inspecting uh, commercial uh, restaurants and kitchens. Um, and uh, it is amazing uh, that such an uh, uh, important issue is 
ignored. And the point that I, I want to thank you for making, and I'm going to emphasize it, is how critically important it is that embedded in these sharing economy business models is illegality. Right. Mm -hmm. right. This is remarkably different than the days 